Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. I'm Kim Flottam. And I'm Kirsten Trainer. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Hey, thanks a lot, Sherry. We also want to thank Bee Culture Magazine for continuing their presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture has been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. Subscribe to Bee Culture today. And while you're there, check out Bee Culture's Beekeeping Your First Three Years, a quarterly magazine for beginning beekeepers. We want to thank Two Million Blossoms as sponsor of this episode. Two Million Blossoms is the quarterly magazine dedicated to protecting all pollinator insects, both wild and managed, before they disappear. Learn more in our Season 2, Episode 9 podcast with editor and our guest co-host, Kirsten Trainer, and from visiting www.2millionblossoms.com, and that is with the number two. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Kirsten. Hi, Kim. We have a great show lined up today with Kirsten. Who are you talking with, Kirsten? I had a chance to sit down and talk with Rachel Benoen. Uh, she's a fascinating honeybee scientist who has then moved into studying Puget butterflies um, and is now moving to Rhode Island, where she will once again be be fascinated with honeybees and all the bees she can find there. Looking forward to that interview. What about you, Kim? What have you been up to? Well, uh, I think maybe a little bit later we'll talk about harvesting some honey. Um, I needed to take some off because I was running out of boxes, so let's just bring that up later. Let's get to Kirsten's guest. I'm kind of anxious to hear her. Before we get to the, the interview, let's talk about the, the harvesting honey. How much honey did you have to take off? Well, I, I've got four boxes on each hive, and I wanted to take two off. And and this year, I moved all of my, I'm going to say moved all my bee yards. I moved my hives around my backyard. Let me put it that way. Mm-hmm. I used to have them in one place, and now I've got them in another. And it makes a difference because I use a leaf blower to get the bees out of the supers. And where do you blow them? And and you don't want to blow them into brush, and you don't want to blow them against trees. So you got to be, you know, you got to kind of pick and choose. So... Uh, that was the first thing I had to figure out. And then I had needed a mile and a half of extension cord because I use an electric bee blower. <laughs> <laughs> but it worked out pretty well. And, and I, can, I can push them far enough away where they don't run into anything and, and, and then grab the box and get it under cover. And I brought two bees into the garage out of, out of six supers. That's wow. not bad. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Kirsten? Uh, so we've been we've actually brought on some nukes this year, and I'm building them up. So we're not going to have a honey harvest. They only had one colony when I arrived here that came through the winter, kind of limping along a little bit because it hadn't been treated for varroa. Um, and so I've I've actually been working on boosting the colonies because we got our um, with COVID everything was shut down, and we didn't get our hives till July. Um, so I've been I've I've just put feet on them to try and help bulk them up a bit. And the research is going well. Yeah, everything else is going well. Um, I'm I'm loving it here in Berlin. It's a lovely city, and yeah, I mean, normally I would be harvesting, and I I like to um, pull honey and brush bees um, with just a bee brush. And what I always mm-hmm. recommend is people always wait for a full super to be full. And if you're a small yeah. scale beekeeper, especially if you have a hand crank extractor, um, that's a lot of weight and a lot of frames to deal with at once. So I prefer if I have three or four hives to steal two or three capped frames per colony when they're ready and throw in the foundation right right after I take it out and then go extract those and then bring them back and then the bees can fill them up again. And I move them in nuke boxes. That's, that's certainly lighter on my back. Oh, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. How do you, how do you work your bees, Jeff? How do you, how do you harvest? Well, <laughs> I haven't had an opportunity to harvest any honey in the Pacific Northwest yet, but <laughs> when I did... <laughs> I always use I always use form uh, uh, the fume boards um, because I'd have a long line of, of colonies and I would just be working two fume boards and put one on a hi- or two on a hive and then just start leapfrogging down and putting them in the back of the truck and and uh, it was pretty efficient that way unless it was a really cool day so I don't know how 
if a fume board would really work here because um, you need a nice warm day. Yeah, for you those do. What, what, what was the uh, repellent that you were using? Uh, Bego, I think, or yeah. Honey Robber, one of the two, um, or probably both, N- but not at the same time. <laughs> I just know I wasn't allowed to bring those in, in, in the garage. They stayed outside in a plastic bag for a long time. <laughs> uh, were you allowed in the house when you were done? <laughs> I never spilled any on myself, so that was a, it's a good thing that way. That can be. Ugly. But I am curious about your using the, the bee blower. Did you have to put anything over the air intake so the bees didn't get sucked into that? No, um, it's, a, it's a leaf blower, it's electric, and, and I can stand far enough away that every bee is going in a different direction, not towards me, but away from me. So, so uh, I don't have a, I have that problem, and it doesn't take long. I mean, that thing's got you know enough power. You can empty a, you can blow the bees off in I don't know fifteen seconds, you know maybe twenty, and boom, the super's yeah. empty. And and then I've got Kathy working with me, and she grabs the leaf blower, and I grab the box, and bang, we're done. So it goes pretty hmm. fast. It's an easy way to do it. Do you run queen excluders? No. Have you you ever you ever accidentally <laughs> blown a queen away? Um, you know, uh, there's an there's an outside chance that I could lose a queen doing that. But when you got a seven a, a stack of boxes of seven high and you're only taking off the top two and they're both capped, the the odds of the odds of losing a queen are so small <laughs> and the time taken to confirm that is so large that yeah. it's a it's it's a it's a safe bet. Let me put I'd, it that I'd way. be I'd be more worried about losing me on uh, trying to pull box number seven off the top. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're all mediums. They're not. I don't use deep. So seven mediums is is about right. You know, that's a that's oh, tall. I, but I not never too like. Tall. Yeah, I'm 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 I don't like ladders in my apiary. So I I tend to and I have pretty high hive stands. So I tend to max out at at five mediums. Yeah. <laughs> well, good. Well, hey, speaking of uh, honey, honeybee management and honeybees, Kim, you had a, a chance to review uh, Dr. De- Dewey Karen's new book. Yes, uh, they sent me a copy early on, and I got a chance to uh, get it read and uh, evaluated it. We put the uh, um, we're going to put the review in Bee Culture Magazine, but I've got one for you here now. If you want to hear it, yeah, let's listen to it. Well, you know, Jeff. If there's one thing you can say about Dewey Karen, it's that he never sits still. He gives talks all over the country, works at the Oregon State University Department of Horticulture, he writes reports for a host of beekeeping educational associations, and he's written over 20 book chapters. He helps with master beekeeper classes and keeps Africanized bees in Bolivia. And he writes books, nine of them now. Though definitely educational and full of great information, his newest book, The Complete Bee Handbook, isn't a hardcore classroom textbook. It's fun, colorful, has both great graphics and great photos. He divided the book into basically three sections, each with three chapters. Section one is The Past, Present, and Future of Bees, where he looks at evolution, bees and society, and the future of bees. Section two is all about honeybees, where he looks at the history of beekeeping, the honeybee itself, and basic beekeeping as practiced today. Section three is the bee lover's home and garden. Here is where I was surprised, Jeff. There's lots about gardening for all kinds of bees and all about honeybee products, honey, beeswax, propolis, and pollen. And the finish was a real surprise. He put in a whole boatload of recipes using honey, how to make candles, lip balm, polish, and soap. I don't know where, I didn't think Dewey had that in him, but there it was. Each chapter also has a short section that sort of summarizes or sometimes highlights the information in the rest of the chapter. One is always the numbers, called appropriately, by the numbers. Another is called, You Better Believe It. And sometimes you'll add a page labeled FAQ, and sometimes a page titled Bees in the popular imagination. These pages are always a color other than white and are easy to find. They're full of good information, even for those of us who have been at this as long as Dewey has, which is over 50 years now. 50 years. Wow. In the back, there are measurement conversions, temperatures, conversion, you know, Fahrenheit to centigrade, weights in ounces and grams, a page of resources, a list of beekeeping books for those more inclined, 
And thanks for mentioning the Backyard Beekeeper, Dewey. Appreciate that. And trustworthy internet sites. And he, find, and he finishes with all of the references sorted out by which chapter he used them for. This is a book you should have on your shelf, Jeff, because it has all of the right information and it would be the perfect gift for someone who is interested in bees but doesn't know it yet. Thanks a lot, Kim. Let's get into the interview with uh, Kirsten and Rachel Benoen. Welcome to Beekeeping Today, a podcast on all things pertaining to bees. I'm guest host Kirsten Trainer, editor of Two Million Blossoms, Protecting Our Pollinators. Today, I've invited Dr. Rachel Benoen to chat with me about bees misbehaving. Well, they're not really misbehaving, but they do some pretty weird things like drinking dirty water and chowing down on meat. Rachel, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to chat with you today. So, Rachel, you work as a biologist and an ecologist. You, your studies of bees have taken you to some very diverse places and made you aware of some unusual bee behavior. What is the weirdest bee thing you've encountered? So I might be the wrong person to ask about weird bee things because I think all bee things are cool. Um, and as a biologist, I dive into the animal behavior and I try to find um, explanations. But one, of, one really fun bee behavior um, that I like to chat with people about and people tend to notice on their own, is if you see a bumblebee on a flower and you go up to it very closely, it might raise its middle leg. Um, mm -hmm. And some people, there are pictures, you can Google this, on Twitter and Instagram of people giving the bee a little high five. Um, so they give, touch their finger <laughs> to the bee's middle leg and they get excited about it. But that's actually a behavior, that's a back off behavior. So when a bumblebee oh. raises its middle leg, it means it's really aggravated with you. <laughs> okay, so it's a little bit like a cat yes. sticking its hair out on end. All exactly. Right. So it's it's kind of a leave me alone behavior. Um, okay. But again, I don't know if that's weird because I think it's cute. Uh, <laughs> no, it's super cute. It's super cool. I'm I'm not gonna try and uh, high high tarsy with a with a bumblebee anymore. <laughs> but <laughs> it's very sweet though. It sounds really adorable. We've all seen bees slurping up water from pools and murky ponds, even when we provide them with nice clean water. What's up with that? So this is one part of my PhD. It's probably the most fun part of my PhD is investigating why honeybees prefer this dirty water. Um, and I've heard some fantastic stories from beekeepers about the dirty water sources that their bees go to. So it's a pretty well-known behavior um, I've heard Please share some of the share some of these dirty yeah. water stories. I'm fascinated. Um, so I've heard cow pies, a beekeeper okay. near a dairy farm. Um, a beekeeper once told me this is word for word what the beekeeper told me. He saw one of his bees on a cat turd. <laughs> <laughs> um, I met a beekeeper from Louisiana. And after okay. they boiled their crawfish, they dumped the salty water down the driveway and the bees went absolutely crazy for it. Um, Interesting. compost piles are big ones, swimming pools. People always yeah, notice yeah. that. Um, but yeah, a lot of feces I've heard, which is super yeah, interesting. There, there's actually, I think it's from Sackett back in 1919, um, where they found honeybees checking out a, um, an outhouse oh. and they were worried that it would be a way for transmitting disease. So they started looking at honey, uh, antibacterial properties and a bunch of other stuff to see if bees could be transmitters of, um, I guess, fecal diseases. But. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is where my research really stemmed from, and I'll get to why they drink dirty water in a second, but um, I was working with an undergraduate at Tufts, and she was keeping the bees, and I was in a library reading about bees, and she called me in a panic because they were... the we keep our bees near facilities on the Tufts University campus because it's the only place they'll let us keep stinging insects on a college campus, basically. Um, okay. And so there's some there's some yucky stuff back there, like puddles and cement and cinder blocks and old truck parts. Um, and the bees are drinking from some pretty gross-looking puddle. So she called me to panic, thinking the bees were going to be sick. Um, right. And so we watched them at the puddles. We were keeping observation hives at the time. So I opened up the okay. hives. They looked totally fine. 
And I literally typed into Google, why do bees like dirty water? Um, and what I found were two really old studies and a bunch of beekeeping forums asking the question. Um, so that's, okay. why, that's why we started looking into it. Is we also thought the bees were going to get sick. Um, but it turns out, so the old studies, the one you just mentioned, and then there's also one from the 1940s um, okay. that looks, on, looks at distillate from cow dung, urine, and something else, I think. Um, and what they found is the bees always liked the cow dung. So the bees always like the stinkiest water, um, as far as we can tell. But okay. that doesn't really... So it might tell us how they're finding the water, right? They can sniff it out, but it's not really telling us why... Why come back to this, right. what we perceive as a disgusting water source? Um, and so we broke the water sources down into different salt solutions. Um, okay. So sodium, which is table salt, we're all used to that, but there are also different types of salts, calcium, potassium, magnesium. Um, and we know these as minerals that we need in our diet. Um, okay. So we broke the water down into these different salt solutions we trained the honeybees to drink from little plastic tubes of the salt solutions, which is actually quite easy to do in the fall when you're not competing with flowers and a little bit more difficult to do in the summertime. Um, we had a lot of undergrads learned about the trials and tribulations of field work that summer, but we did it. <laughs> um, and we watched the bees drink from these different salt solutions. And what we found okay. is their preferences for salt solutions differs based on the season um, mm -hmm. and with whatever flower, what flowers are available. So okay. no matter what, no matter what's flowering or what season it is, bees love water with sodium in it. Um, okay. And it's not shocking because most plants, so any kind of herbivore, anything that eats plant matter is usually lacking in sodium because plants just don't have a lot of sodium in them. Um, Interesting. Okay. And so this makes sense. So the bees are likely going to water sources to look for sodium um, when their plants don't offer that up. But the coolest part, and maybe the weirdest if you're not a bee person, um, is their preferences change when we look at calcium, potassium, and magnesium. Um, and these three minerals, they really like them in water in the fall. So they're coming mm -hmm. to drink water with potassium, calcium, and magnesium in the fall, but not so much in the summertime. And so what we okay. did is we collected pollen from our bees. So we trapped pollen as they were bringing it back to the hive um, and looked at what minerals are in the pollen. So what minerals are they actually getting from their floral diet? They're not getting any sodium, which like I said, wasn't a surprise. Um, and in the summertime, they're getting more potassium, calcium, and magnesium than in the fall. From the pollen. From the okay. pollen, um, which is super cool. But the calcium, actually, I misspoke there. In the summertime, they're getting more potassium and magnesium in their pollen than in the fall. Okay. And so they're supplementing those two minerals in their diet. But surprisingly, in the fall, they're getting more calcium. So in the fall they're getting a lot of calcium from their flowers and they're going to water sources with calcium. Um, oh, cool. So this was super interesting to us because when you look at the graphs um, in our paper, they're just, it's so, it's just so obvious. The calcium levels in pollen are super low through most of the summer. And then there's this huge spike um, in the fall and that's in the pollen and in the bees themselves. So we took it even a step further um, and looked at the different minerals in the bees. Um, and what we think is happening with the calcium is it's, it's an important mineral for muscle movement. And as beekeepers okay. know, one of the ways, well, the only way um, bees get through the winter is by vibrating by their muscles. Vibrating all those muscles. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so we think this calcium um, intake from their pollen and from their water in the fall is a way in which they're preparing to overwinter, which is okay. super cool. Um, and did you analyze the pollen to figure out the plant species to know if it's coming in from the goldenrod or asters or? That is a fantastic question. Um, we did, but that data is still in progress. Uh, gen Fair enough. <laughs> genetic data is, it's a big data set. Um, so I do have some information on what flowers were 
not necessarily flowering, but what flowers the bees were collecting pollen from um, okay. during that time. So TBD on that. Um, okay. I'm, but, I will, will have to speak to you again sometime <laughs> soon after, after the, the next paper comes out. Yeah. So, um, but you've, you've also had some experience with, with not non-honeybees, yeah. including vulture bees. Mm-hmm. And so before our listeners conjure up horror stories of bees taking a nip off their bodies, can you tell us more about this fascinating bee biology? Yeah. So vulture bees are super cool. Again, most people might think they're weird, um, but I think they're <laughs> awesome. So honeybees get their protein from pollen. So I just talked a lot about mm-hmm. pollen. Um, vulture bees, which are a type of stingless bees in the tropic, get their protein from meat. Um, and so okay. they're really important decomposers in the tropic in this way, because a lot of the meat is carrion or dead animals. Um, okay. So they're really useful. They're not scary. Um, they're also stingless <laughs> bees, so they don't sting. They, they, do, they can bite, which is annoying, but they don't sting, so it doesn't hurt. Um, um, well, I mean, some of them, they have suicidal <laughs> stingless bees that will bite you and, and not let go. So yes. I'm, I, haven't, I haven't had a chance to work with stingless bees yet, but it is, they're not as sweet as we imagine. They're definitely not, and it's interesting. Um, I've worked with them twice now, three times actually, and it's crazy. Their pheromones just seem so much stronger than honeybee pheromones. So um, Nick Dorian and I, we've done vulture bees, well, stingless bee stuff in Costa Rica twice. And the first time we tried marking the bees with a little paint dot with the bee squeezer, the little sponge plunger a lot of beekeepers can use to mark their queen. Um, Okay. We marked one stingless bee with this little bee squeezer and minutes later, the thing was like swarmed. by a ton of other stainless bees. And I've never seen that in honeybees or bumblebees. Like it was crazy. Um, so I do think they oh, have. Oh, from the paint where you used a paint marker? Yes. And they swarmed yeah. the bee squeezer with the paint marker. So I think their pheromones are definitely stronger as far as someone bad is here. Um, but with vulture bees, <laughs> we didn't mark them and we studied them while they were foraging rather than at their home. So they didn't really care okay. about us. Um, but they're important decomposers for the tropics. They collect protein from meat and there's two types of vulture bees. So there are true vulture bees, which are obligate meat foragers, which means they only get protein from meat. Um, and they have modified corbiculae, which is super cool. So they're easy to identify. Um, so they don't have, are they shoving the meat onto their baskets? So no. So the true, the true meat for the true vulture bees that are obligates, they, it's kind of more like a honey crop. So they ingest, it's actually pretty gross now that I'm thinking about (laughs) it, but their saliva has an enzyme that breaks down the meat. Breaks down. And they basically make like meat soup and they slurp it up (laughs) into their crop. And that's how they bring the meat back to the hive. So those are the obligate foragers of meat. They're also facultative foragers of meat, which are the ones we really studied in Costa Rica. And they put little chunks of meat in their pollen baskets, um, which that might be the weirdest behavior we saw. We were shocked when we saw them put little meat, meat chunks in their pollen baskets. It was, that was also kind of I, gross, but it was fun. I wonder the aerodynamics. How do they even get that to stick? I mean, it's, you know, pollen is dry. You can pack it. You can get it to really stick yeah. to the hairs. I'm just wondering. Yeah. The- really like little teeny balls of meat. Like you're saying, it's not like a homogenous pollen pellet. It was like yeah. a bunch of little balls of meat. Um, Interesting. And so we don't know these facultative ones, if they're going to the meat for protein or maybe salt, because meat can be salty. So Nick and I okay. soaked our chicken in different salt solutions Um, and it turns out bees in the tropics also really love sodium. Um, okay. So they might be visiting carrion for sodium as well as protein. (laughs) Fascinating. Fascinating. Better Bee is pleased to present the interviews by Kirsten Trainer. As a supplier to our nation's beekeepers for over 40 years, Better Bee provides the tools, equipment, and information you need to succeed. Through its many beekeeping employees, Better Bee serves you with solutions to your beekeeping challenges. That's why they can say with confidence that they are your partners in Better Beekeeping. 
Thanks to Better Bee for their informative catalog, website, supportive beekeeper education, and for sponsoring the series featuring Kirsten. Be sure to see the latest at betterbee.com. So I know you love bees. I, I do too. I'm a, I'm a little bee crazy. They're, they're pretty irresistible. <laughs> but you've also, you've also studied some beautiful butterflies. What can you tell us about them? So the butterfly I know the most about and studied the most is the Puget blue butterfly. And it is this brilliant, bright blue butterfly um, in the South Puget Sound in Washington State, which is why it's named the Puget blue. Um, and there's two, two behaviors I've really delved into with these butterflies. Um, the first actually happens when they're caterpillars. So okay. these caterpillars, Puget blue caterpillars, they're these cute, squishy green things. They kind of look like Sour Patch Kids. Um, when they get scared or freaked out by, say, a predatory wasp or a spider that might eat them, um, they actually signal for help either via scent or sound. We're not sure which um, the species is doing. And ants come and respond, which is super cool. Um, and they protect the caterpillar while, you know, the wasp or the spider is there. The ants will either walk around, could kind of patrol the plant the caterpillar's on, stand on top of the caterpillar. Um, sometimes they even carry the caterpillar. I don't think that happens in our species, but it does happen in some. Um, and when the threat has passed, the caterpillar secretes a little sugar droplet from a specialized gland near its bottom as a thank you to the ants, which is super cool. Okay, so it really is a mutualism. The ants are being rewarded for protective behavior. Yeah. So one of the things I was tasked with studying um, is figuring mm -hmm. out how important these ants are for survival of the caterpillar. Uh, this is a threatened okay. butterfly. So we were interested in if the ants are this Im Im super important for survival of the caterpillar, will they affect the butterfly population downstream and how we might we be able to um, make this interaction happen more often if the caterpillars need it. Um, but unfortunately, again, trials and tribulations of field work, these caterpillars are super hard to find in the wild. Um, okay. So we searched for them over three field seasons and found, I think, a total of seven of these caterpillars, which is like wow, crazy. Yeah. How not, many hours, how many hours were you in these fields? There were so many hours. There was one day <laughs> where I had nine people helping me search for these caterpillars. Um, that, that's so a lot like of eyeball an hours. Eight hour day of nine people. Um, so yeah, obviously not the sample size you need to publish on this behavior. We did see ant okay. tending a couple times. It's called ant tending. Um, and this field season, unfortunately, because of COVID, I am not in the field, but I have field techs that are in the field. And what we okay. did is we raised some caterpillars in the greenhouse. So we had okay. them in our possession <laughs> and we put them in the field and you, you kind of bother the caterpillars by poking them with the blade of grass. Um, so they'll uh -huh. signal the ants. So I had two field techs doing this 40 times with 12 different caterpillars. They saw ant tending once. So, oh no. My hypothesis is that ant tending isn't really that important to the survival of this caterpillar. Okay. Um, which obviously, you know, we wanted to see some cool animal behavior. Um, but it, sure. it bodes well for the caterpillar, I guess, if ant tending is not that important. Um, right. It means, it means like they can make it potentially on their own without ants. <laughs> right. Exactly. Which is good. Um, so that's one of the big behaviors I studied for butterflies. And then the other thing we're working on is, um, adult nutrition in okay. butterflies. So nutrition is kind of the overarching theme of most of my research. Um, and one of the things we're interested in, in these Puget blues is how important nectar nutrition is to adults, because a lot of butterflies can get a lot of nutrients as a caterpillar and just kind of sequester those. And then adult okay. feeding isn't as important. Um, mm -hmm. we, we don't know if that's the case with these butterflies. So I had an undergraduate find and follow butterflies last year to see what they nectared on. Um, and we took samples of the nectar to see what amino acids and sugars might be in the nectar. We raised some in the greenhouse on different diets to see how their egg laying rate was. One of the most surprising things we found 
was that 60% of the time, female Puget blue butterflies were nectaring on closed flowers of their host plant. Huh. So, <laughs> like, unopened If they're bugs. closed, yeah, so if they're closed, what are they getting off of them? So that's part of why we did these, um, we did this thing called washing in the field. So you take a flower, okay. you shake it in water, and then you can do some chemistry to see what amino acids and sugars came out. So with the unopened buds, we just took a whole unopened stalk of the plant. Um, <laughs> and it turns out there's quite a lot of amino acids in those unopened buds. Okay. We don't know where they're coming from. Um, there's some kind of extra floral gland or there are aphids on the plant secreting something. But it was a behavior we did not expect um, but I'm excited because that same undergraduate is in the field this year. She's um, from Portland, so she went home and she can continue the field work, which is fantastic. Uh, oh, nice. And we'll see what she finds this year. Um, one thing we're and, interested in is how male and female nectaring preferences might differ. So maybe males need different nutrients than females. Sure. And then are, are they only on one host plant, these Puget Blues? Yeah, so these caterpillars are host plant specialists, which is another thing that makes um, conservation kind of tricky. So they mm -hmm. only lay their eggs on a plant called sickle-keeled lupin in the Pacific Northwest. Okay. And um, that's what the caterpillars eat. So there is some research showing the caterpillars can survive on different types of lupin. So maybe it's a matter of finding the right lupin if we can't conserve this one. Um, but in the case of a, there's a closely related butterfly, the Fender's blue, whose preferred host plant is a threatened plant. And so that gets even trickier um, as okay. far as conservation. But And are these lup lupine fields disappearing, I take it? or Yeah, so the lupin is a fire adapted plant. And we, okay. we suppressed fire for so long that a lot of prairies in the Northwest kind of disappeared, um, mm -hmm. be it by invasive plants or woody woody things like Douglas fir um so I think it's very low percentage maybe something like two or three percent of the Pacific Northwest prairies remain um which is oh, wow crazy but one of yeah. the cool things out there is you know they've they've recognized the importance of fire and now they manage a lot of these places with prescribed burns um and so hopefully we'll see kind of an increase in the prairie prairie habitat soon but we yeah, kind of to... that, I mean, it must be stunning. It must be a stunning field site, oh. even if it's frustrating that there are not very many caterpillars. Yes, it's definitely worth being there. Um, Mount Rainier, you can sometimes see from the field site. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. Very beautiful. And I hear you're moving to Rhode Island. What will you be doing there? Yeah, so I will be an assistant professor of biology at Providence College, and I'm super excited. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. So I'll be teaching classes in environmental biology and pollination ecology in the fall. Um, and then I'll also be getting a lab going. And as I said, nutrition is kind of the overarching theme of my research. Um, so what I'm really interested in is, I guess, in general, how nutrition modulates interactions between species mm -hmm. or with species in the environment. Um, so why are bees picking certain plants to get nectar and pollen from? or what in the environment might be, I don't want to say causing or forcing, but what in the environment is changing so that bees are searching for water with salt um, instead of nutrients from flowers. So I will be going back to honeybees um, and possibly some native bees. I'm really, really curious to just put some meat out, like raw chicken. <laughs> That's what we used for our study. I want to just put some raw chicken out and see if anything comes to it because no one's done this. Other than flies. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we know flies will come, but no one's really looked at this in a temperate area. It's only been tropical. Um, that would be fascinating. So that would be fun. And then I'm also uh, going to stick with the ant tended caterpillar as well. So we have okay. in on the East Coast, the frosted elfin, which is, um, mm -hmm. it's a state listed butterfly. So it's rare, um, but where it's found, it is common. So hopefully those caterpillars okay. will be a little bit easier to find. Um, but the cool well, thing about this one is it has two host plants. 
Okay, uh, so a little more diversity. A little and more potentially diversity. where it exists, more of them. Yes, that's so the hope. <laughs> ha- happy hunting, and I hope it works out. <laughs> Thank you, but yeah, so, I'm interested in um, how host plant nutrition might affect this ant tending behavior. So we can raise yeah. the caterpillar on the different plants and see what happens with the ants, hopefully. And there's there's so much we still don't know about plant host inter. Um, interactions and mutualisms. I mean, it's fascinating how old historical samples are now telling us about changes in protein content over time. Um, so I'm, I'm sure you will find all kinds of fascinating um, interactions that we had just no idea existed. I hope so. So uh, as an ecologist, what do you think is a key issue facing bees? And it, not just honeybees, it can be all bees, your favorite bee. <laughs> I think honeybees are my favorite bee, but um, (laughs) I think all bees and I think pollinators in general, a big problem is just the lack of nutrition. Um, Mm -hmm. So bees, honeybees visit flowers for food and, you know, with urbanization and agriculture, we're kind of taking a lot of that food away or we're replacing it with less diverse resources. So in the case of agriculture. Um, So I think that's a, it's a big issue, but I think it's an issue we can tackle. Um, it's just a matter of understanding, you know, what these flowers are offering to pollinators, what the pollinators need. And maybe in the case of agriculture, instead of, you know, changing the whole field, what flowers can we plant nearby or what kind of supplements can we give our bees? As beekeepers know, there are so many supplements for honeybees on the market. It's crazy. Um, and it's great. It feels a little bit like snake oil salesman. Yes, there's <laughs> so many. And it's just kind of like, but do we know, do they need all of these nutrients you're giving them? Or are some of, yeah. is some of it just getting, you know, excreted later on? Um, so I think nutrition. Yeah, they've now done one. some really interesting work on um, seaweed and, and how that is helping bees. Oh, so. maybe because it's salty. Maybe. <laughs> it's, it's out of the uh, Baton Rouge out of the Baton Rouge, it was giving them protection against disease, I think, actually. I can't, I don't remember the details now. I'd have to look it up again. I'm but. definitely going to look into that. That's super cool. So, yeah, I think it was Michael Simone Finstrom's work. Okay. Um, so, yeah. And, yeah, it came out of the Baton Rouge lab. I'll have to double check that. So, you've given a TEDx talk called Embracing Science as, as a Verb. And you've also written a children's book called Dress Like a Scientist Day. Can you tell us about the common theme of embracing curiosity in both of those? So curiosity is something that is natural in kids. Um, And if anyone (laughs) knows a child, they probably know that kids ask a zillion questions, right? Um, They're learning about the world around them and they want to know all about it, which is fantastic. Um, And I think curiosity, whether we realize it or not, tends to get a little bit squashed as we age Um, whether that be because, you know, we're focused on one particular thing at work or time just goes by too fast, or you're taking care of children and it's hard for you to pay attention to the world around you as well. Um, and so I really, I guess, I don't want to say, what do I really do? I really hope to help people realize that this natural curiosity is a tool um, that should be harnessed, whether you're a kid or an adult, right? So in science, it's, I mean, everything's based on curiosity in science. Um, and I love the fact that a lot of my research is just basic natural history and interactions and figuring out what is happening and not necessarily, you know, the nitty gritty molecular details of it. Um, right. So curiosity is, just so important to science, but I think it's also important to just being a citizen in the world that we live in or being a good community member, um, asking questions about what's happening around you and why that's happening. Um, I mean, you know, engineers, architects, business people, like you need to be, you need to ask questions and not be afraid to ask questions. Um, and then also kind of find your own answers or look for your own answers, whether that be in books, online, on TV, or actually outside in the field, like what I do. Um, yeah. And so- no, it, I I fully agree. It, it, it's always it's always the questions that sort of drive 
things I've done as well. It's like, well, why are they doing that? And and how do I find out more? And even even my view, I think, how, of how it's expanded from honeybees to other bees in part is driven by, but I put in a pollinator meadow and my honeybees ignored it, but all these other things showed up. Right, right. Yeah. So it's, it's the unexpected and just looking, I think, is, is one of the things we, we somehow lose the uh, time to do. Yes. Yeah. I think the, the busyness, the hustle and bustle is really what kind of, I don't want to say squash, but kind of puts that curiosity on the back burner, whether we realize it or not. Um, and one of the things in the time of, you know, all of this COVID and staying home, there's a lot of stuff happening that's not so great. But one thing that's happening that I think is good is people are paying more attention to what's happening in their own backyard because that's where they are. Um, yeah. My in-laws have recently got very into birding in the woods behind their house. And so they asked me about I'm all excited. kinds of birds now. Um, yeah. So I think people, a lot of people are rediscovering that curiosity because they've been a little bit forced to slow down um, because of what's yeah, happening. Yeah. I- I know there's been a run on a lot of the garden centers because they've still been allowed to to be open. And so planting of gardens and everybody getting back to digging a little bit in the dirt, which for me, of course, is a wonderful thing. The more we plant, the better off we are, I think. Yeah. yeah. And more nutrition for all those pollinators. So Exactly. So one final question before I let you go. If you had to pick a pollinator avatar to represent you online, mm-hmm. what would you go with? I would 100% go with a worker honeybee. (laughs) Okay. I don't like to be doted on, so I would definitely not be the queen. Um, And I... Because she's got a tough day in front of her. I I mean, she's got to just keep popping those eggs out. (laughs) Not, no, that's not my kind of day. Um, But I do like to stay busy. I do like to do things as efficiently as possible, which we know bees, honeybees are pretty good at. And my friends always joke with me because I have a crazy sweet tooth. Um, and so the bee is obviously my spirit animal because they love that honey. Um, I once, when I was doing one of my studies, I had hot chocolate with me cause it was during the fall and the bees, okay. the bees found my hot chocolate. Um, and they were really, so you had to share. well, I had to hide it cause I was doing a foraging study. So I didn't want to mess things up. And then when I hit it, they were very upset and like buzzing around the spot where it was. They remembered, you know, where the hot chocolate was. Um, That's hilarious. And so like worker bees, I also have a crazy sweet tooth. So I think that would be my avatar. Well, I hope you get a chance to harvest some honey from colonies you establish up in Rhode Island. Me too. And, and keep, keep uh, plugging away at all that you do. Thank you. I definitely will. And thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks, Kirsten, for bringing us that great interview. Rachel, uh, Rachel seems like a uh, quite the person. Yeah, she's an amazing ecologist. I always like her perspective because she tends to put it into a broader picture instead of just focusing on the individual bee's behavior or butterflies, um, depending on whatever she's working on. Vulture bees? Really? Yep. I've never heard of that. <laughs> How amazing. But it makes sense when, you know, and what you just said, she brings in the bigger picture. It makes perfect sense that, 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 uh, there's a, there's a opportunity for a food source and they take advantage of it. Yeah. Especially in a, in a nutrient poor area where it's hard to get, to get those important salts. Um, I just think it's hilarious that they chew up little bits of meat and pack it onto their pants like regular pollen. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> little meat spitballs or something. It's just pretty much. Um, take, it takes me back to junior high or something. I think. Um, you know, I found it interesting. I always enjoy the discussion when it comes around to water sources for honeybees, and 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 I will have to say I've I've never seen honeybees on on cat poop or any poop for that matter. And, and silage and, and and dairy farms around the outskirts where there's water, but never really sitting there on a. Any. Yeah, me me neither. I have they. I always had ponds, and so they would go sit on the water lilies and drink from that, or on the the lava rock for the filtration system, uh, where they wouldn't end up washed in, and they could they could drink their fill. They seemed to love that. Um, but I was mm-hmm. in a, I was in a valley that had pretty mineral rich water, so maybe that that was enough for them. So I always find them in um, bags of um, 
uh, in the fall, I find them in bags of uh, leftover potting soil or, or compost. Interesting. I've definitely seen them pack coffee grinds onto their onto their legs. Um, and I think that's just because they weren't finding pollen. The weirdest thing I've ever seen bees packing onto their their pollen pants was sawdust, um, which, I mean, that has no nutritional value at all. I have no idea what they were doing, but they were rolling themselves in that sawdust and packing it on like you wouldn't believe. So they wow. apparently saw a need for it. <laughs> kind of like you see them in, at bird feeders in the late fall. Uh, yeah. Just before, just while they're a, still able to fly before it's winter, you'll see a bunch of them at, at bird feeders and they're doing the same thing yeah. with the dust. So it's, uh, maybe they're like, I, I got the, I got the assignment to go get something. I'm, I'm, I'm not coming home empty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not going to be the one. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Well, I liked her discussion not, not, uh, um, about the, the Puget, uh, Puget blue butterfly and, and being in, in central West Washington and there's several prairies around here and especially around, uh, I'm not too far from JBLM joint base Lewis McCord and they have big, big prairie areas and, uh, I, Gave me something new to look for uh, in the in edges of those prairies to see if I find any of those uh, pretty cool looking um, uh, blue butterflies. And I'll, I'll put a picture of those in in the um, show notes. But they're really pretty. I have to yeah, keep an eye they out are for them. gorgeous. I can't believe the man hours they spent hunting for caterpillars. Nine, nine a team of nine, and <laughs> that would just be so frustrating. Looking under every little leaf, not finding any. I, you know, I don't recall. Did she say what plant they they lay their eggs on? Is it, is it plant it, specific it, or is it, it is plant specific? So yes, they they have one host plant. She's actually very excited. I don't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but she did mention it in the sh- in in the talk. Um, she's actually very excited because in Rhode Island there's a very similar butterfly, but it has two host plants, so that'll double the chances of her finding it. It was a lupin, wasn't it? I think, I think it was. It was. I believe. Yeah. I believe that's correct. Yep. Well, I like the uh, that mutualism that 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 uh, mutualism she was talking about with the caterpillar and the ants. That was yes. that was that was. I've heard of insect, uh, other species of insects interacting like that, but I've never heard of a butterfly and ants. That was pretty cool, or a caterpillar, a butterfly caterpillar and ants. Um, and then at the end, giving off a drop of sugar for the ants. So yes. everybody, it's a win-win. <laughs> it's definitely a win-win. You gotta, you, you gotta, you gotta pay your protectors. <laughs> well, that about wraps it up for this podcast. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts wherever you download and stream the show. Your vote helps other beekeepers find us quicker. Even better, write a review and let us know what you like. You can also check out our Facebook page, our Twitter feed, and our Instagram feed. As always, we want to thank Bee Culture for their continued sponsorship of Beekeeping Today podcast. We want to thank our regular episode, Global Patties. Check them out at www.globalpatties.com. And we want to thank Better Bee for their sponsorship of Kirsten's interview. Find them at www.betterbee.com. And finally, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to send us questions and comments at questions at beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. Anything else? I think that about wraps it up for me. I was just going to put in a a quick plug for Rachel's book, Dress Like a Scientist. Um, It's available online, and it really encourages children to realize that scientists come in all shapes, forms, and are not only wearing lab coats. It's really adorable. Pocket protectors are optional. Pocket (laughs) protectors are definitely optional. (laughs) All right. Thank you. 